get me. From Studio A in Arcata, behind the Redwood Curtain, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcast. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's this episode's host from up the coast, the man who puts the X in Xbox and the tie on antisocial... Comedy Soundcast Soundcaster, Tyson Saner. Saner. Insaner. 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 Featuring Matt Knudsen and J. Keith Van Stratt in each their separate segments. It's a great episode that you can still listen to on Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, PodBay, SoundCloud, and many places other than Spotify. And, of course, you can always find us and our show archive over at www.suckatashshow.com, where this episode that you are listening to right now absolutely resides if you are, in fact, listening to it. And if you are listening to this, then you will no doubt be delighted with what I've got in store for you. I managed to convince J. Elvis Weinstein to have a chat with me very recently. I was thrilled to be able to do so, and I'm still smiling about it. Mr. Weinstein is a stand-up comedian, actor, filmmaker, musician, and writer for television who has been in the business more or less since shortly after he began performing stand-up comedy at the age of 15. Many of you may or may not already know this, but he is a founding member of Mystery Science Theater 3000, one of my favorite television shows of all time. Now, I don't want to talk too much at the head of the program, and I already run the risk of doing so, so without further ado, here is the first half of our chat with an interruption from our fake sponsor, Henderson's Pants, to be followed immediately by the second half of our chat. I will warn you, the sound is a bit rough at times, which is 100% on me. My audio actually dropped out a few times, and I will be making no attempt to hide that, as you may or may not notice. Please enjoy. Oh, my pleasure. I don't mind the audio. I don't mind just the audio. Well, thank you. Your episode of Gilbert Gottfried's amazing Colossal Podcast. Uh, yeah, it was. I think a couple of years ago now, but it, or, you know, everything with the, with the pandemic, it's hard to even remember. It might have been three years ago now. Oh, yeah. It's a hilariously long introduction. It's almost, it's almost like being at your own funeral. Because it's not like they put it in after. <laughs> so you have to sit there and hear your whole life be read. By Gilbert Gottfried. And then he did Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. Episodes of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Okay. Ah. 
Oh, we love that. Yeah. Yeah, there was all these viral videotapes. There, you know, there was Shatner doing Rocket Man, and there was, you know, there was all these. Uh, there was the guitar comic who hit the audience member in the head that went around the comedy community. There was all sorts of ones, but they got, but they got physically passed around. Yeah. Cool. Um, whatever, you know, I'd be happy to. Uh, the I Need You to Kill is a stand-up comedy documentary about the uh, uh, then emerging stand-up scene in Asia, seen through the eyes of three American comics who go on tour there to uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and Macau. Um, Tom Segura being one of the comics. Um, just He was sort of just kind of breaking as, as we took the trip. Um, yeah, he was indeed podcast famous. I, in fact, there was a, a fan of his waiting at the airport in Singapore when we arrived. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a, uh, both a really fun adventure to make. And, uh, and I think it came out as a fun movie to watch. I want to actually edit it myself, so I feel especially good about that. I edited I added a Need You to Kill, yeah. Yes, I was very proud of that. I, of course, the only one. <laughs> yes. it, got, it got applause at the screening. No, it's better if it, it's much better if it sneaks up on you. It's kind of the only time I've ever seen that flavor of joke in a doc. So I was pretty proud of that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. You're a Patreon patron. Okay. The soundcast I am thinking of is called Trashy Trashy. So gaming is a big theme with you. Right. Right. It's 
really, I think ju- it's a way to justify gaming is what you're saying. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Here is where I change the subject to the film Skidoo. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, depending on your definition of bad, but certainly, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's it, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a terrible film, but it's such a spectacle of like, what am I watching? That it is it's captivating, which is that is not true of all bad films. And but this is this is way above average, captivating because because it's Groucho Marx and Jackie Gleason and Carol Channing and Frankie Avalon and and Nielsen doing the music and it's just like this crazy mix and Otto Preminger doing an acid movie trying to stay young and relevant when it's just way past any chance of that happening you know and it's just it's 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 something I recommend everyone get get a get a good hold on because it, it 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 can't disappoint you know Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nielsen. Yeah. Nielsen sings every word of the credits. Yeah. There's only there's only a couple movies in my life that I really like, and you wouldn't think this is true because I'm a mystery science theater guy, but there's only a couple of terrible movies that I actually truly love, and Skidoo is one of them. And that's good. I came to Skidoo very late. I came to Skidoo uh, from Frank Conniff when we were doing Cinematic Titanic about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, but the other one that's been a lifelong one for me is the uh, Robert Stigwood, uh, Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band movie with the Bee Gees and Frampton. Because it's another one that can't disappoint because it's rooted in Beatles music. So there's a, this constant familiarity that's always there while you're watching this com- just amazing coke fueled shit show. Um, but because there's Beatles music and not some strange music you have to swallow, you know, it just holds you. It holds you in and embraces you and its and its awfulness. Yeah, I mean, you know, it just, it, you know, it's, I don't know. It's a, that one's a lifelong, a true, a truly lifelong fascination. That way. Yeah. That, see, that can disappoint. Right. It was indeed, and that you know that you know that does not stand up as a pure audio thing. Uh, no, uh, it wasn't Donald Pleasance. It was um, I, I blanked on his name, but a very Donald Pleasance like actor. George Burns is in there. He does fixing a hole. Um, the only the only truly good covers in there are uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire doing uh, "Gotta Get you Into My Life" is a good is a genuinely good record, and uh, and Aerosmith doing "Come Together," though it's perfunctory, is a good cover of that. Yeah, it is pretty good. And like I said on the show this week, it's like I don't really remember the the filmmaking that much, which I usually do. But because there was like 
all this stuff to learn about Nielsen that I didn't know. That's what I walked away with was all the info. Well, I made one of those. Michael Debar, who do you want me to be, is is very much about a uh, a musician that most people haven't heard of, but when when you see the movie, you go, "Oh, that guy." Yes, he played uh, he played uh, Murdoch, MacGyver's arch enemy. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, mi I missed where this was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you can tell the difference, it says me the color that matter. Okay, sorry. You know how I podcast. I just kind of roll with whatever's being thrown at me. So, yeah, it's, it's not really embellished in any way. Right. Uh -huh. It's weird to host an antisocial show with a friend. Oh, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, I think we started in May. Oh, thanks. So far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. I 
didn't I came to it didn't come to I didn't come to the Beatles through my parents at all. Um, so I, I I was probably ten or eleven, like probably you know you know in fact that Sergeant Pepper movie was part of what got me into the Beatles when it came on HBO when we first had it when I was a kid. Um, but uh, yeah, no, my early teens were were completely Beatle consumed. Teens, I was into Zulu Nation hip hop, like De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest and the Jungle Brothers. Oh yeah, I wish I, I really wish in in retrospect I had myself switched in that direction. But. Yeah. I was very much in an MTV trance for, you know, for three, four years. That was kind of my, you know, that was very much where my, that was my, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't hitting the record stores and being adventurous. I was being fed music. Um, I, boy, I, you know, I, I don't really, you know, I, I like Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You kind of always comes to mind as just a striking image. Um, but you know, if you would ask me in 1984, if I had favorite videos, yeah, I'm sure I, I had lots of them. Uh, I never cared weirdly. Yeah. And they didn't put the directors on in the early days of MTV. Right. That, that, lower, that lower left hand corner bug. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't until much later that they put directors on there when directors were actually had just were basically working for free. And that was the only thing they got out of the video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was always, uh, as a kid, I was always much more interested in the in the uh, the band than the than the video itself. Yeah, I was, I was okay with. It. I don't know. I was, I, you know, I was just I, as a kid, I was always trying to figure out what was going on and what I was watching. Like I was like watching, you know, trying to figure out where the studio audience was on sitcoms, and it was. I was always deconstructive about things so i would think about the band being there on the set having to act or you know yeah i have i, I have the complete inability to suspend my disbelief not complete but pretty complete I don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. All right. This portion of Succotash is brought to you by Henderson's, innovation in pantaloons and trousers since 1896. Almost 80 years ago, when Grandpa Al Henderson was struggling to raise a family during the Great Depression, he did what any unemployed family man would do, he shoplifted food. But he did it the right way and never got caught because he used his patented Henderson's kleptomatic trousers, made with pride in the USA with not four, not five, but 11 expandable pockets that drape and shape naturally while stylishly concealing fresh fruits and vegetables, eggs, even live poultry, and feed a family of five while never once alerting market vendors or law enforcement officials. Well, as they say, everything old is new again, 
And now, Henderson's is proud to offer Kleptomatic Plus, microchip equipped to neutralize barcode scanners, exit alarms, and other loss control detectors, so you can walk through any door with confidence. That's Henderson's Kleptomatic and Kleptomatic Plus trousers, helping you provide with confidence in every stride. And now, back to more of Succotash. And thank you, Bill Haywatt. And now, for the second half of my interview with Josh Elvis Weinstein. Sure. I did. That was my first uh, network TV job, was later with Greg Kinnear. Oh, yeah. I came in the second week of the of the show airing. I was working on uh, Talk Soup at the time when I started. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, again. <laughs> now we need to know what sticks. That's little the things that stick with people over the years. <laughs> okay, yes. I now I actually do remember that one. But I actually I just have very strong memories of Demon Dog Day. There were they were uh they were um uh, uh Masters of the Universe Battle Bones. That, that we that I assembled all of and uh then we painted them orange. Uh, yes, the the uh, the head one. I think I think part of that cape was uh, was uh, the inspiration that I think I I inspired that cape with the as uh, to make him like Enoch the Slee Stack. From that yeah. But you you still picked it out, which is good. Right. Yeah, well, there's, there's definitely, a, you know, there's jokes for everyone in that show, that's for sure. He did the jokes. You get the sea hunt jokes. I did, yes. Um, would you care to ask anything about it? <laughs> I don't. I don't have anything prepped. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, 
Uh, it's on the the cinematic Titanic box set. Um, and is it like in an office? Well, I vaguely remember that. I, yeah, that was. I mean, that was done. Um, I think we did the box set in like 2017, and I think we wrapped up things with Cinematic Titanic in like 2013. Yeah, I'll go anywhere you want. I just, like I said, I just don't have a, a prepped. Uh, I'll answer anything you're curious about for sure. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing deeply in the works. I still have to figure out how to actually. Uh, uh, make money from doing it. Not not a lot of money, but uh, some money making docs because I love them. But uh, I haven't cracked the business side of things. So go to Amazon and buy Michael Day Bar. Who do you want me to be? Yes, it is. Right or both? If you're a super fan. Yeah, you probably don't have to say mobile phone anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think he that he he uh, had a mobile phone, the James Cagney one. It would have. Right. It's like a mystery science theater joke. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, it was it was Frank uh, Conniff did a series of radio musical plays, essentially. Um, and I did, I did like three of them. So I, that, so they're kind of blurry. Um, but what did I play in the wonderful abundance of Oz? Your call? Was it a lion? Was it the lion? Uh-huh. There was another one where I played like a, like a young heavy metal singer. Um, and it was, it was, it was, you know, it was fun. And we, uh, that's uh, I did one with Lorraine Newman, which was certainly cool to do. And uh, I met my friend Mark Thompson uh, doing that, who I ended up being doing a podcast with him called The Ed Show. And I uh, do a lot, do radio on KFI here in LA with him occasionally. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I, I you know it was it was I don't have a lot of memories of it because it was one of those. Frank sent me a script and I went into the studio and recorded and that was kind of my gig. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, was that with Ali Gertz? And we talked about Flaming Moe's, I think. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, I had met Allie. We did a show together, a stand-up show together. And when she called me to do the podcast, I had sort of forgotten that we had already sort of talked about it. So I like I made I double checked to make sure she, she didn't think I was the other Josh Weinstein. And she was like, We talked about this. I'm like, oh shit, okay. Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, I think it's, I think people sort of conflated my all, you know, thought that I was both the mystery science theater and the Simpsons guy. Um, so, you know, like I remember, I remember when we went on Mark Maron's podcast, he was like, so Simpsons. And I was like, no, different. I'm the other guy. Um, uh, but <laughs> right. Luckily, I was, on, I was on with Kindler, so it blew by very quickly. Um, so, no, but I've, I've met the other... In fact, Josh Weinstein and I actually worked on the same show um, before, one, before I even moved to L.A. He worked on it here, and I worked on it remotely from Minneapolis. It was a show called Sunday Best. And uh, so, I, and I did... He was a, he was a writer of, of record, and I was like a consultant getting paid by somebody. But so I still had, there was still a Josh Wein, written by Josh Weinstein credit in a show that I was writing on. But he was, he beat me by, you know, by about a year and a half to the, to the name and the Writers Guild. So that's why I became J.L. Elvis Weinstein. But I've had lunch with, I've had a lunch with Josh Weinstein. I think he's Weinstein and, and he goes by Weinstein. Um, we've had lunch and, and crossed paths several times and uh, he got one of my checks once in the mail. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, his, and his writing partner is Bill Oakley, who's now become famous for his fast food reviews. Um, yeah. Yeah, he does. He does sort of ins, one minute Instagram reviews of things. He's been he's been widely covered for it. I never did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I doubt it all. I don't know that I'll take them, but I will definitely lift, hear you out. <laughs> okay. Is this a doc? Is this a doc or a... scripted? Scripted. Okay. 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 Okay, like stand, like stand, like six foot tall, like stand up. Left. Oh, he's walk. He can walk through it. Okay. All right.
But well, well executed, it sounds like. Okay. That was Dave Builds a Maze. Made a maze, okay. Okay, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Skyfall, the the Bond movie. All right. I don't think I saw Skyfall. Yeah, I care a little. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. I got a little bored with what we had. I needed to spice things up a bit. It's time for questions. What do you want to know? We love your questions so much. It's half our show. Half our show. Yes. I don't. don't. I don't have a lot of patience for musicals. With, you know, with limited exceptions. A little bit, yeah. Uh, fame I, buy, I bought into enough. Sing in the Rain, I like. Okay. Okay. This I got completely wrong. The songs in the film are completely based in what is occurring in the reality of the situation portrayed in the film. Almost total diegesis. Okay. Not the lady killers. Yeah.
Well, it's a pretty diverse slate you're bringing to the table here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, they completely took over the comment section to of the of the Amazon. Yeah, it's very it's very Baba Booey, but uh, but that's okay. I'd rather have people be you know I'd rather have people be uh, enthusiastic about it for some reason than no reason. Nah, I'm not very precious about things once they're out into the world. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that, you know, I could let annoy me or not. And I definitely went with the not on that one. No, you do. You certainly didn't. At this point, I asked Mr. Weinstein about his video game playing. Um, I've, I've been in this very weird kind of uh, hands-off thing with video games over the last few years because it's... Uh, um, I get mad at myself with how much time I, I'm able to uh, dump into them. Uh, it doesn't feel like productive time to me. And I get mad at myself for applying uh, the kind of work ethic I should be putting towards other things towards that. But I, lo- I, I really like gaming a lot. Um, the last game I actually like settled into was Red Dead Redemption, I think. The, the first one, and I played through that a couple times. And then the second one, there was too much bullshit. Too much bullshit between the shooting and the riding. Yeah, I, I really loved it. Um, but, I, you know, I like like the other one. Of, I like Ratchet and Clank a lot, too. Yeah. Uh, just because it's a nice bridge to the kind of games I grew up on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not. Like, cause one of the things is I'm, I hate I hate first person shooters. Yeah, and that you know takes a lot of good games off the table. Um, I just don't. I don't like operating that way. I like seeing. I like third person. Uh, no. Yeah. 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 I could see getting into that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, although, you know, I, I tire of most, most story elements and, uh, and, and cut away kind of stuff very quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I like the gameplay, but I don't really. I do, you know, if I, you know, like I said, like I said, like I said, my ability to suspend my disbelief is none. So it's just it's just noise to me. Yeah. Now there's, there's any number of games I could totally get into. You know, it's it's more of just like it's it's you know it's the same reason I don't do cocaine. You know, I'll I'll like it too much. Probably was probably if you haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, also the opportunities to do cocaine <laughs> kind of dry up. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think you need any more antisocial behavior. I don't know that you need a third antisocial person on your show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a safe bet. Yeah, so it's sort of like a video game, a video version of MDMA, kind of, of ecstasy. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think coke's probably easier still. Probably, I think coke. I think coke. There's still plenty of bartenders at various places you can get. problem apparently these days is that if you get the coke out in the street it's very likely to have fentanyl in to fentanyl in it and kill you so okay i'll scroll, scroll through the things uh if you want to hear my stand-up comedy i have an album called chunks available uh if you want to see either of my movies this, uh, i need you to kill is available on amazon prime uh, with enhancements by uh, your mom's house listeners, apparently. Um, and uh, my more recent movie, uh, Michael DeBar, Who Do You Want Me to Be, is available uh, at stream, you know, wherever uh, video on demand places and also available on uh, DVD and Blu ray. The movie that I co starred in with Andy Kindler called The Fiddling Horse is available out there. And the podcast I co star with Andy Kindler called Thought Spiral is out there. Well, you'll at least see what we look like in action. I do, yes. Uh, buymeacoffee.com slash thought spiral. Hey, 
It was my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for uh, thanks for supporting my stuff. That's very cool. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Bye. -bye. And there you have it. I really did have a great time chatting with Mr. Weinstein. I absolutely forgot a few things that I was going to ask about or mention. But for the most part, I satisfied my curiosity as a fanboy. I'm going to thank Mr. Weinstein again here for his willingness to sit and chat with me and the patience he exhibited. By the way, I just found out that The Fiddling Horse is available to watch for free on, um, T-U-B-I. I don't know if that is meant to sound like Tubby or Tubi. It really could be either. It's probably Tubi. But I do love a good streaming service, or at the very least, a streaming service that has what I'm looking for to watch. So I have that in my near future to look forward to. I also look forward to the next episode, 293, that will be hosted by Mark Hirshon, and who knows what wonders he has in store for you. It's a rhetorical question. At any rate, thank you for listening. Be decent to each other. Be cautious when it comes to the health of others, if not your own. And if someone asks you if you have heard anything good or interesting lately, and you think of us, we'd really appreciate it if you please... Pass the Succotash. You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast, with your host, Tyson Saner. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Succotash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at tyson at succotashshow.com. Or call into the Succotash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at hightail.com slash u slash Succotash. Sarkatash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Saner. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Sarkatash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Sarkatash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.